The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Developing a Therapeutic Game Plan for the Management of Hepatocellular Carcinoma. Expert Insights from the Patient Casebook. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash BXY860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. On behalf of Peerview, I, I welcome you all and thank you for joining me and my colleagues. I'm very fortunate to be joined by very, two very, uh, very good friends and very eloquent speakers in the liver cancer space, Katie Kelly from UCSF. Uh, a local uh, and a 49ers fan, I suspect, and uh, Amit Singhal from UT Southwestern, probably a Cowboys fan, but no. doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you all for joining us tonight uh, for this CME uh, event, and we'll be talking about advances in liver cancer. And, and having been in the space for some time, it's amazing to think that there's CME activities for liver <clears throat> cancer, considering the lack of progress in the field for so long, but that has clearly changed uh, in the last two, three years and is changing approximately every six months now. So I will be opening the evening discussing first-line options and practice changing data. So, you know, I take this slide from Amit. Uh, he put this together very nicely and it really highlights why we're speaking tonight. While there has been a lot of progress in the last few years, Really, if we look at the cancer problem in the United States, we've made a lot of progress in lung, breast, and colon cancer. New treatments there, earlier detection, have improved outcomes. But if we look at the cancers that are increasing and leading causes of cancer death, liver cancer has actually grown more than other malignancies. And that reflects not only the burden of disease and the, reflects the problem of underlying liver disease in the United States, which is largely goes unnoticed, I think, until it becomes more advanced, and then even advanced liver disease, and then looking for liver cancer in those patients with liver disease, but also reflects the fact that we haven't had real progress in our therapeutic approach to this disease for some time. And that has changed, and we'll start off our data presentation with a case. 59-year-old gentleman with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, what is also commonly called fatty liver disease, uh, which will lead to cirrhosis. And, and while we have seen uh, uh, effective treatments for hepatitis C, which has been driving the incidence of liver cancer for so long in the United States, that presumably will be tailing off over time. But diabetes, fatty liver, obesity, and uh, uh, eventual cirrhosis will remain to be a leading cause of liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. So this patient is child PUA, which is well compensated, has an AFP of 178, but keep in mind that's not used to diagnose the disease. The disease is based on, typically can be diagnosed on imaging with a hypervascular lesion with delayed washout in a patient with cirrhosis. This patient has no stigmata of end-stage liver disease, of, such as ascites or encephalopathy, good performance status, and presents initially with focal disease in the liver, which is treated with chemoembolization uh, with good disease control. However, we know that chemoembolization is not a curative procedure, and eventually patients will progress beyond what can be controlled with chemoembolization. And this patient develops now multifocal disease, the largest being six and a half centimeters with invasion of the right portal vein. So this patient still has cancer confined to the liver, but is advanced because of the involvement of the portal vein. So what are his treatment options at this time? So since 2008, serafinib has been the standard of care for these patients. The SHARP study, which you're all very familiar with, established a role for systemic treatment in the management of liver cancer. Keep in mind, before this data, no systemic drugs were shown to improve survival in liver cancer. And it gave an opportunity for local regional treatments to fill that void. Chemoembolization was something that had been, do been done for many years. And even though patients who had characteristics beyond those that showed a benefit with chemoembolization, it continued to be done. Then comes around the SHARP study, which shows that for patients such as the one we just talked about, who has advanced disease, serafinib improves survival. 
This study had a median of three months, but a, uh, a risk reduction as represented by the hazard ratio of 0.69 or a 31% decrease in the risk of death. And this study ushered in a new phase, a new way of thinking about liver cancer, that systemic treatments can change the natural history. However, and I remember being uh, interviewed at the time of the SHARP study, what's the projection for the future of liver cancer? Oh, this is great, we're gonna have new drugs every few years. We had trials, a lot of trials, but we did not have any new drugs for about a decade. And we did gain some real-world experience with serafinib over that time, which assured us uh, the safety of the drug. We know that hand-foot syndrome, GI toxicity, such as diarrhea, anorexia, weight loss, are the most common things. And the incidence of these side effects seem pretty stable between child A and child B patients. But the expected activity of serafinib in child PUB patients is less, meaning that survival is very much dictated to performance status as well as their child PU status. And in clinical research versus clinical practice, right, in research we concentrate on the child PUB A patients because it's in those patients that we can show the anti-cancer activity of a systemic drug. For patients who have more comp decompensated liver disease, their risk of death is from cirrhosis, and it might be very hard in the context of a clinical trial to show that we can change an outcome or improve an outcome as related to their cancer. However, in the real world, not every patient we see clearly fits into a clinical trial paradigm. They have some decompensated liver disease, uh, and they may be child PUB, they might not be performance status zero or one. But data from this observational study, the Gideon study, at least gives us some confidence that the drug is safe and tolerated, similarly as in the child PUA population. So the first new drug in frontline setting, and actually now we only have two drugs that are currently approved, and first line was lenvantinib. Lenvantinib, like serafinib, is a small molecule inhibitor of the VEGF receptors, very potent, similar to serafinib. It differentiates itself as it does have increased kinase activity against the fibroblast growth factor receptor, and FGFs have been pursued for some time as a mechanism of resistance to VEGF, that if you develop resistance to VEGF-driven angiogenesis, perhaps the FGF family can uh, drive that. But also, FGF is a growth factor uh, that has been described as important in proliferation in liver cancer. So there is some differences in the kinase profile, and in a small phase two study, uh, single-arm study, lenvantinib seemed to have a little higher response rate and very provocative survival. So that led to the REFLEX study. The REFLEX study was a very large, over 900 patients, 950 patients, open label, so everybody knew what they were getting of lenvantinib versus serafinib in patients with advanced liver cancer, uh, child PU A, they use this term Barcelona B or C. And for those that aren't familiar, the staging system in liver cancer tends to be the BCLC staging system. And those that have C are patients who have metastatic disease or vascular invasion, whereas those who are Barcelona B, that's not child pu B, but Barcelona B are those that have typically liver-confined disease and are in good shape and are the ones where uh, chemoembolization has been shown to improve survival. But again, like in this case, even though you're Barcelona B and you get taste, eventually you will stage migrate to C or you will become taste refractory. Unique to this study, which was different from other phase three studies in advanced liver cancer, is it excluded patients who had more than 50% of their liver involved by tumor or clear bile duct invasion, not the most common thing in liver cancer, but invasion of the main portal vein. Right? So when we say main portal vein, we're talking about the portal vein that is outside the liver. Right? The portal vein comes in and then it branches into the right and left and subsequent branches. It's very common for liver cancer to grow into those vessels and it starts in a small branch and eventually migrates to the main portal vein. But those patients who had main portal invasion were excluded uh, and they generally carry a very poor prognosis. And here you see the stratification factors, and lenvantinib, unlike serafinib, is based by weight. Less than 60 kilos, 8 milligrams, or 12 milligrams 
uh, for those who are greater than 60 kilos. And that is different than the doses used in thyroid cancer or kidney cancer. So this study was powered for non-inferiority, and it met that endpoint. So we saw linvantinib did 13.6 months survival, serafinib 12.3 months, and serafinib performed better here than in the SHARP study, which was about 11 months. And this has a ratio of 0.92, uh, and here you see the confidence interval, the upper limit being 1.06. If it was up less than 1.08, that allowed us to declare this a positive study for non-inferiority. Now, interestingly, the primary endpoint of OS was non-inferior, but if we look at some of the secondary endpoints, we see that Lenvantin performed better. Here, looking at progression-free survival, 3.7 months to 7.4 months, has a ratio of 0.66. And interestingly, responses were higher with linvantinib. For a decade, we knew we could improve survival, survival being the most important endpoint in cancer studies, I would argue, but we could improve survival with serafinib without a high response rate. Here with linvantinib, if we look at overall response, here looking at independent review, using modified resist, which again is a way to look at liver tumors that take advantage of the unique characteristics of cancers in the liver, liver cancers in the liver, that they're hypervascular. So instead of measuring the total size of the tumor, the sum of the longest diameter of the tumor, we're measuring the sum of the longest diameter of the enhancing component. So by modified resist, the response rates were about 40% with lenvantinib, 12% with serafinib. By conventional resist, response rates were still fairly high, lenvantinib about 19%, and as we saw in historical studies with serapinib, single digit, about 7%. Now, the adverse event profile of these two drugs have some overlap and have some differentiation. Both of them cause hypertension, but lenvantinib is a much more potent angiogenic inhibitor, and therefore, we see more grade 3, 4, and all-cause hypertension. Both drugs cause anorexia and diarrhea, similarly. Uh, and weight loss, as well as fatigue. Hand-foot syndrome, we know, is a problem with serafinib. It's one of the more common side effects. Certainly higher grade is more common with serafinib than linvantinib in this study, and even all grades is less. However, more potent and more uh, uh, frequent with linvantinib is proteinuria, again, representing this VEGF effect, an on-target effect, and therefore, your analyses need to be performed on a regular basis to monitor that, just as we do with other VEGF-targeted drugs. So immunotherapy has impacted every area of oncology, right? And uh, certainly liver cancer has been touched, and initially the approvals of nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which we'll, we'll hear from Katie, were based on single-arm phase two studies in the second-line setting. However, as many of you are aware, and it's a great privilege to, uh, to uh, share this data with you, which is probably one of the first times, I think, in the United States, uh, as it was only presented at the ESMO Asia meeting uh, in November, is this combination of VEGF inhibition and PDL1 inhibition. And while this, fo this, this slide focuses on the roles of bevacizumab and atezolizumab, I think in many ways, there is a generic effect here for PD-1 inhibition and VEGF or VEGFR targeted agents. Now, bevacizumab, you know, has been around for a long time, and conventional thinking uh, and the basis of the development was that we starve tumors of blood, uh, angiogenesis is a hallmark of cancer, and therefore we can have a cytostatic effect. It normalizes the vasculature, which probably explains its uh, synergy with chemotherapy in lung cancer uh, and colon cancer and other malignancies. But our understanding of the microenvironment and the role of VEGF and the endothelium has evolved over time. And there's preclinical data that suggests that bevacizumab can change the immune microenvironment, decreasing the amount of immunosuppressor cells, increasing those that have uh, 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 immune presentation cells, and then, as you know, drugs like atezolizumab or nivolumab, pembrolizumab, durvalumab, among others, by interfering with the PD-1, PD-01 interaction, can activate T cells 
to attack the tumor. And so this paved the way for the combination now of bevacizumab and atezolizumab in many malignancies. Uh, and here we're going to be looking at data in liver cancer. So the first study was this single arm phase one, which then became a phase two study. And it's in its most mature uh, data presentation, had an overall response rate of 32%. Now that is a number we have not seen in liver cancer data sets. Uh, here with two monoclonal antibodies. And you can see on the waterfall plot here, even those that had responses and then a number of patients, 45% of patients had even stable disease as their best response. Uh, and here you see the spider plot for this, uh, this data set. And the median PFS was about 15 months. So like we saw with other IO agents, Responses tend to be very durable, and here the response rate was higher than we saw with single agents. And the safety did not include anything new. Obviously, we're dealing with a cirrhotic population. We get concerned about underlying liver uh, function. But really, in this selected patient population was a child PUA. All of these patients, importantly, had endoscopies to make sure they did not have varices, so they had to be scoped within six months. Uh, we did not see a high incidence of GI bleeding, uh, and generally a side effect profile that could be explained mostly by bevacizumab and to some degree IO events uh, from atezolizumab. And here you see uh, a spattering of events that have been described with these drugs. Now, the most recent data that had come out to support this combination was this study that looked at single-agent atezolizumab versus the combination. We know 10 years ago, many of us did studies with bevacizumab in liver cancer, 2006 to 2009. Uh, and it didn't look all that active. It was mostly cytostatic. In retrospect, maybe if Bev went versus placebo, maybe we would have had a positive study. But needless to say, it was not pursued for registration at that time. However, you know, we needed good data with single-agent atezolizumab to give us a sense whether the combination is synergy or maybe it's just atezolizumab's activity in liver cancer. Needless to say, the combination here gave a response rate of 36% uh, with long duration. And if we look at PFS, the atezolizumab PFS was 3.4 months, and that was increased to 5.6 months with the combination, suggesting that there is an additional benefit with bevacizumab uh, compared to atezolizumab. And there were some more adverse events when the combination was used as compared to single-agent atezolizumab. But again, when we saw uh, in the other cohort, uh, and as we'll see in the phase three study, those are generally manageable. So the I Am Brave 150 study was the definitive study of atezo and Bev versus serafinib. Uh, this was an open-label study given two IV drugs versus an oral drug. This is a very classic Typical phase three study, good performance status, uh, child PUA, uh, Barcelona B or C, but advanced cancer. And again, patients had endoscopies within six months, and it had two endpoints, progression-free survival and OS. And many studies now in the frontline setting have included progression-free survival because we now have so many second-line agents, we're seeing an increase in overall survival for patients with newly diagnosed liver cancer. And it has raised the question that we'll be able, will we be able to show OS given crossover and things like that? Now, here we see the progression-free survival endpoint. It met its endpoint, serafinib 4.3 months and atezobev 6.8 months. That's a hazard ratio of 0.59 and was statistically significant. And this is the first time we have a positive study for improvement over serafinib with a, using an active control arm. As nice as the PFS data is, what's really the most important, I think, is the overall survival data. Here you see serafinib performed at 13.2 months, very typical data set in the modern era for serafinib. However, at the time of follow-up, still the median survival for atezobevacizumab has not been reached. You can see these curves separate early and remain separated over time. Uh, the median still was not reached here at 13 months, and you can see many patients are censored and remain on study. That translated into a hazard ratio of 0.58, right? So that's a 42% reduction in the risk of death with this combination versus serafinib. 
and I'll, I'll just throw out response rate was 27%, very similar to the phase 1B, phase 2 study with uh, the combination. And here you see the safety data. And in uh, light orange is all grades, and in the darker color would be grade 3, 4. Similar pattern with a Tezobev, light blue would be all grades, and then grade 3, 4 in darker blue. And clearly there's more hypertension uh, maybe with a Tezobev, but other toxicities are fairly mild and very similar to Serafdib, and if not better. And if we look at delays in quality of life, this certainly favors the combination. Uh, if we look at time to, de to, to detrimental a change in quality of life, three and a half months with serafinib over 11 months with a Tezobev. And here you see, uh, by several measurements, preserving role function and physical functioning significantly improved with the combination versus serafinib. So there's other combinations that look very exciting, LEN and pembrolizumab, lenvantinib, the TKI we talked about in the reflex study, and pembrolizumab, a PD-1 antibody. Here in this uh, phase 1B study, initially 30 patients, we had a response rate of uh, 42%. Uh, and in updated data, this is still staying strong, around 30%. And really no new toxicities with this combination. Uh, again, seeing the common things that we see with lenvantinib and also occasional things that are associated with pembrolizumab. But the response rate certainly suggests... Uh, 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 Synergy, but not synergy necessarily for the toxicity. And this data was updated at ESMO, and here uh, response rates by modified resist still very high, over 40%, CR rate of 6%, and an even stable disease, 37%, which can lead to survival advantage. So this has led to the phase three LEAP study, which is actively enrolling. This is a double-blind placebo-controlled study of lenvantinib and Pembro versus lenvantinib and placebo, powered again for OS and progression-free survival. There's ongoing interest in these combinations, a number of studies in frontline, and clearly the first choice for any patient with advanced liver cancer in the frontline setting is a clinical trial, I would argue. And we have cabozantinib and atezolizumab versus cabozantinib alone versus serafinib. Uh, this study is actively accruing. Katie, I know, is very involved with that. And there are several abstracts at this meeting that are building on our understanding of liver cancer in the frontline setting. So in follow-up to this patient we discussed, who now has portal vein invasion, uh, progressing aftertaste, who is still in good shape, we have several options available. So Rafnib and Lenvantinib, you could argue, are both equally effective here, given the OS endpoint. Bev and Atezo, not yet approved, but certainly would be a good option. And certainly, if the patient qualified a clinical trial is something I would strongly recommend. Um, and so um, I'll give the second part of this talk today um, with the title of The Game Changer, Navigating the New Wave of Second-Line Treatment Options in Advanced HCC. And really the reason for the title The Game Changer is that the, the idea of second-line or later-line therapies in advanced HCC is really a new one. Um, for, for the longest time, it's, it's really systemic therapy for HCC, HCC has really been a, a one-and-done kind of scenario where after serafinib, patients would generally progress to, to end-stage cancer and end-stage liver disease and, and be done with their, their uh, intent at palliative uh, therapy, um, anti-cancer therapy at least. And um, what we see now with both uh, better therapies for patients with liver disease, thanks to our colleagues in hepatology, but also more active therapies in the first line, and now for the first time, options for downstream therapy, we're seeing that um, on this slide I'm showing here that there are actually patients um, going on to receive, a substantial number of patients going on to receive downstream therapies. And here are a couple examples. This is from the Checkmate 459 trial of, of first line um, serafinib versus nivolumab. Um, where about half of patients go on to receive second-line therapy after progression on this trial from both treatment arm as well as control arm. And likewise, in a second-line population, Keynote 240 of pembrolizumab versus placebo, which I'll show you in a moment, again, almost 50% of patients go on to receive third-line therapy. So again, this is really quite startling and striking and, and encouraging to realize that about half of patients go on to receive downstream therapies and have an option to, to have improvement in their cancer outcomes even after first line. So that brings me to our next case, um, patient number two. Um, this is a patient from my clinic, a 50-year-old 
54-year-old with chronic hepatitis B. She was Asian and had good uh, viral control on Intecavir. Um, received taste for an initial uh, six centimeter right lobe liver lesion, but unfortunately uh, soon after showed enlargement in that um, initially treated lesion, um, as well as two satellite lesions and a new branch portal vein tumor thrombus making her BCLC-C, which Rich so nicely explained. Um, she had preserved liver function, child PUA, and good performance status, and an elevated AFP of 142. So uh, at that time, following upon the, the recent REFLECT trial data, um, she was started on lenvatinib, uh, 12 milligrams daily. Uh, she did require dose reduction to 8 milligrams for fatigue and hypertension, but um, had a really nice response with regression and, and, um, and prolonged benefit for about six months. Um, uh, thereafter, um, she did have new lung metastasis and a rise in her AFP, uh, prompting the question, what is the appropriate next line of therapy? In this case, what's the uh, best second line therapy? As, again, the intro to our, our uh, next part of this talk. We, we do now have um, multiple options um, for first line therapy, as well as second line and downstream therapies in advanced HCC. And so I'll, I'll cover these sequentially, which is really in, in their order of um, evolution clinically. Um, with regorafenib, cabozantinib, and ramucirumab being anti-angiogenic therapies, and then two immunotherapies now with FDA approval in the United States, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, based on single-arm uh, phase two data. So starting with uh, regorafenib. So regorafenib is another multi-kinase inhibitor, quite similar to serafinib structurally with the addition of a fluorine moiety, which actually confers greater potency um, in its uh, target inhibition. And so in the phase three resource trial, um, the patients with HCC with uh, progression after serafinib, again, the only uh, treatment with efficacy at that time, um, patients who had tolerated serafinib at a dose of about 400 milligrams per day or higher, so half of standard dose or, or better, for at least 20 of the past 28 days um, were eligible for enrollment if they had progression on serafinib and tolerance on serafinib. Um, patients were randomized two to one to either regorafenib at a dose of 160 milligrams per day, three weeks on, one week off, um, versus placebo with the primary endpoint of overall survival. And this shows very uh, strong survival improvement for regorafenib compared to placebo with a median overall survival of 10.6 months for regorafenib versus 7.8 months for placebo hazard ratio of 0.63 leading to approval of regorafenib as a second-line therapy in the U.S. and in multiple other area, parts of the world um, um, around 2017. And then this was a, a huge landmark in the field as the first second-line therapy for advanced HCC. And we look further into the data and see that this benefit was quite consistent across uh, clinically relevant prognostic subgroups, including uh, region, which is a proxy for hepatitis B or C status in most studies, um, regardless of AFP level. So low AFP and high AFP both benefited similarly. Important to remember as we look to remisirumab ahead. Um, also, um, according to macrovessel invasion or not. And here again are the viral results. So, um, as I mentioned, regorafenib has similar structural uh, features as to serafinib, and as one might expect, it also has similar toxicity profile. Um, the predominant side effects are hand, foot, skin reaction, diarrhea, fatigue, hypertension, anorexia, um, or, and uh, we see the grade three rates in particular for hand, foot, skin reaction are about 13%, likewise for hypertension. So these are um, class effects that need management just as for serafinib. So turning to the next second-line agent to be uh, approved in this context, cabozantinib. Um, so cabozantinib is another multi-kinase inhibitor, but does have a distinct target profile from both rego and uh, serafinib, um, including um, the, the same anti-angiogenic kinases like VEGFR2 and 3, but also um, one key difference is that it, cabozantinib inhibits MET, or a hepatocyte growth factor receptor, um, which is thought to be implicated in anti-angiogenic resistance. Um, and so cabozantinib was studied versus placebo in the phase three celestial trial, also in child PUA, advanced HCC patients who had had prior serafinib. It did not require any particular tolerability to serafinib. So patients who had failed serafinib due to intolerable side effects were eligible, unlike resource. Um, and another difference from the resource rego regorafenib trial was that uh, the celestial trial allowed either one or two prior therapies, so included a mixture of second and third line therapies, 
uh, third line patients. Uh, patients were again randomized two to one to CABO versus placebo. And the end primary endpoint again in this registration trial was survival. And so here we see that CABO had a significant overall survival improvement over placebo, 10.2 months versus 8.0 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.76. We did um, present a sub-analysis of this data for the strict second-line population, which showed an even more pronounced benefit in the second-line setting. Uh, similarly, progression-free survival was also improved, 5.2 months versus 1.9 months for placebo with a hazard ratio of 0 0.44. And we see um, relatively symmetric survival, uh, survival and, as it turns out, also PFS benefit across, again, the clinically uh, relevant subgroups um, and prognostic subgroups, including both uh, patients with one or two prior line of therapy showing um, PFS improvement. So turning to tolerability and toxicity, again, as an uh, anti-endogenic tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we, as we expect to see, um, hand-foot skin reaction is also a significant uh, side effect of cabozantinib with grade 3 or 4 and 17%, uh, diarrhea, 10%, grade 3 or 4, um, and hypertension, uh, again, being the noteworthy class effects that we, uh, as expected in this context. So turning to the third agent in our, our second line list of, of therapies now available, um, ramucirumab. Ramucirumab is a, not a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but rather an anti-angiogenic VEGF-R2 monoclonal antibody given intravenously. Um, and um, I think it's really important to note that ramucirumab's story is another landmark in the field of HCC because it has now become the first agent with a biomarker. Um, and the, the, this evolved in that um, remesirumab was first studied in a trial called REACH, uh, as phase three study, looking at all patients according across AFP values, serum AFP, and uh, showed a, a trend toward benefit, but was not statistically significant for, for its primary endpoints. Sub-analyses according to alpha feta protein cut points, um, looking at uh, various cut points, 100, 200, 400, showed that patients with uh, increasing levels of AFP had a trend towards improved survival and progression-free survival, as well as other efficacy endpoints, which does uh, potentially stand to reason in, in that AFP is uh, a marker for a pro-angiogenic um, or um, an increased level of, anti of angiogenic activity, signal genomic signaling in, in patients with high AFP. Um, in terms of ge their genetic signatures of the tumors. And so um, looking at this sub-analysis of the, the REACH phase three trial, um, it was really intriguing to see this, uh, this benefit in the high AFP group um, compared to those same high AFP patients treated with placebo. Um, and that prompted the, the launching of a second phase three trial, REACH two, just in patients with high AFP greater than 400 nanograms per milliliter. And sure enough, in the second trial selected for the biomarker of AFP, um, ramucirumab did achieve a significant survival benefit. Um, admittedly modest, but though there is a, a notable tail on this curve, and the hazard ratio was 0.71. To increase the power of this analysis, um, here we see a combined analysis of the patients with high AFP from the initial REACH, REACH-1 study, as well as all patients with REACH-2, and shows a, a more pronounced benefit when we have a greater sample size um, with overall survival of 8.1 months for patients with high AFP treated with RAM versus 5.0 for those treated with placebo. So collectively, the data from REACH-1 and REACH-2 have led to approval of ramucirumab as another second-line option with the first biomarker selected requirement for eligibility for the therapy of AFP greater than 400. Um, another uh, example of anti-angiogenic class effects of adverse events here, we see uh, rates of hypertension um, in the ramucirumab group of about 12.7% um, 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 grade three or higher um, compared to placebo. Um, and also, um, as expected for anti-angiogenic therapies, um, and a slight increased rate of bleeding, although again, not so different than placebo, noting that patients with advanced HCC are susceptible to bleeding events such as variceal bleeds. And so the safety profile was actually, I, I would take this as a reassuring um, in terms of the, the bleeding risk of this agent. Um, um, but hypertension is particularly important to manage in, um, as it is for the anti-angiogenic tyrosine kinase inhibitors. 
Hepatic encephalopathy is also noteworthy, something that, again, rare, but um, an important side effect to manage um, and highlighting, again, the importance of us taking care of patients with liver disease and being aware of management of their chronic underlying liver disease in parallel with the cancer. So turning back to our case, again, the patients who had been treated with lenvatinib for advanced HCC as first line, um, how do we treat her now that she is progressing with new lung metastases and uh, right portal vein tumor uh, thrombus? Um, so the second uh, line choices for this patient are, you know, how do I approach a decision like this? Consider the adverse event profile of the drug, AFP levels, liver function, comorbidities, and prior treatment history. And so in this case, regorafenib was not an appropriate choice in that she was treated with first-line sorafenib, excuse me, first-line uh, linvatinib and had not received first-line sorafenib. So um, I did not choose uh, regorafenib for her. Um, her AFP level, um, although elevated, was less than 400, so not an appropriate candidate for ramucirumab at this point. Um, and in this case, um, I treated her with cabozantinib because the trial allowed up to two prior lines of therapy, and one of which was not necessarily uh, uh, sorafenib, and did show a trend towards benefit in hepatitis B patients. So she started on cabozantinib 60 milligrams daily. Um, again, based on the fact that Celestial had a permissive uh, in, uh, eligibility allowing second and third line patients after various prior lines of therapies. And we can consider AFP should her, uh, consider remesirumab should her AFP rise higher in the future. So that brings me to the next patient case, who is a, a 69 year old male with um, hepatitis C, who was previously treated and cured with direct acting antiviral therapy a few years ago, now presenting with right upper quadrant pain, found to have also another case with a large right lobe liver mass, this time with uh, synchronous satellite lesions and a right portal vein tumor thrombus that was enhancing and compatible with malignancy. Um, he had signs of portal hypertension with uh, low platelets at 95, an elevated bilirubin, um, and a mildly elevated alpha fetoprotein. Has history of hepatitis C, as I mentioned, with uh, portal hypertension, some diabetes, and hypertension. Uh, performance status of one. He is BCLCC because of the vascular invasion, though there was no extra hepatic disease. He started on first-line serafinib with empiric dose reduction, uh, or actually, but required dose reduction because of uh, toxicity. Um, he continued for two months, but had worsening pain and rising AFP throughout that first two months, and had early interval restaging imaging and showed prompt progression on his first scans, including extension to the contralateral lobe and enlargement of the right lobe mass, extension of the portal vein tumor thrombus. So by contrast to the prior lady who had been treated with linvatinib and had a nice response for at least six months, this patient had immediate progression, prompting the question, well, what do we do next? So that brings me to the discussion of the role of immunotherapy in the second and later lines of HCC treatment now. Um, the first uh, large trial to really examine the efficacy of this new realm of, of immunotherapy and oncology in the HCC context was the, the phase 1-2 Checkmate 040 trial of nivolumab, which, as everyone recalls, nivolumab is a, um, a, an anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibody, with, which has shown efficacy across a variety of, of tumor types. And the phase 1-2 Checkmate trial started with a... a a monotherapy nivolumab arm, which I'll show you in a moment, but is now expanded to a variety of different cohorts, and I'll cover a couple of these as we go. So in the first part of the study, dose expansion, I think it's really important to highlight in a hepatitis C patient population, again with a hepatologist sitting next to me, that we really have to think about safety in a different way and make sure that our drugs are safe in the context of liver dysfunction, particularly in the context of uh, the risk of immune reactivation or immune hepatitis in a, a liver disease population. And so the Checkmate 40 trial was, uh, I think, very prescient and, and wise to design their dose expansion phase one in three distinct cohorts defined by viral status, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and uninfected or non-viral, and to first take a very close look to make sure that immune therapy, immunotherapy with P1 inhibition was safe in this compromised population. And I think the take-home points from this busy toxicity table, which um, you, you don't need to read all the details, are that the toxicity was quite similar to other tumor types, and most importantly, in this laboratory value section highlighting transaminitis, the rates of grade three or higher transaminitis are quite low, less than 5%. So very reassuring that we're not seeing a higher rate of immune hepatitis in this population. Um, from the phase 1b expansion of over 200 patients, 
Uh, the spider plots of response are shown here, and I think these are quite striking for a couple reasons. One, we see that there's a dramatic proportion of patients with downward trending spider plots. Um, and these are uh, measured in weeks, which here, for, for example, is um, here's the one-year mark of 50 weeks. So these are, are lines. The, the second thing that's dramatic, besides the downward trend in all these lines, is also the duration of these lines. Um, and that some of these lines go down to the zero uh, or 100% shrinkage rate. So what we're seeing is a substantial number of patients with regression that lasts a long time, including a few with complete or 100% responses. And that was true in the uninfected patients who had not had prior serafinib, about 80 patients, and the objective response rate was 23% in that cohort, quite durable. In the uninfected patients, meaning no, non-viral with prior serafinib, the objective response rate is 21%. For hepatitis C, 20%, hepatitis B, 14%. And the median duration of response was um, over t about 10 months or longer, depending on which data cut and cohort we we're looking at. And this, the strength of this data, coupled with its safety, led to FDA approval in 2017 for advanced HCC after failure of serafinib. This data also prompted uh, the recently reported Checkmate 459 trial, nivolumab versus serafinib in advanced HCC. And I should clarify, this was a first-line study, so I'm straying into Rich's territory here because it followed upon second-line data. Um, and this was a randomized one-to-one -one trial, um, open label of nivolumab versus standard of care serafinib in child PUA first-line advanced HCC patients with survival endpoint. And this was uh, the data presented at ESMO um, showing um, actually that the study was negative, did not achieve a statistically significant survival benefit in the overall population. Um, there was a trend towards improvement, 16.4 months for nivolumab versus 14.7 months for serafinib. Um, noting, again, that both of these cohorts did quite well compared to our historical data, which was, has always been generally less than a year until quite recently, speaking again to the value of multiple lines of therapy. Um, Progression-free survival was also similar between the two arms. But what we can see is that similar to the phase two data, there was a subset of patients with prolonged deep responses, about 14%. Uh, excuse me, about 16% uh, uh, overall, with 4% having complete responses, 12% partial responses, and the median duration of response, um, 23 months. So while the overall population did not benefit enough to achieve a positive study, um, there are a subset of patients with deep, durable, meaningful responses, again showing um, out of this data set. Um, Health-related quality of life, shows that the patients receiving nivolumab um, had favorable changes in their health rate of quality of life um, compared to, to serafinib across a variety of domains. So uh, reinforcing the data from nivolumab, well, we also have uh, phase two data looking at um, pembrolizumab in patients with pre previously treated HCC, pembrolizumab being another anti-PD-1 uh, monoclonal antibody, Keynote 224. Um, looked at about 100 patients with uh, second-line HCC and um, also examined their um, objective uh, response. Um, and we see very similar to the nivolumab monotherapy data that about 17% uh, of patients had a prolonged uh, durable response. Um, again, also reinforcing and uh, reassuring that the safety data from nivolumab was um, was similar in this, uh, this other antibody. Um, we see um, an acceptable rate of uh, increased ALT and other transaminitis of about 5% or less. So again, reassuring that there's no increased rate of immune-related hepatitis. So that second line data prompted a, a, the Keynote 240 randomized phase three trial of pembrolizumab versus best supportive care as a second line uh, agent. Um, and so uh, pembrolizumab versus placebo uh, was uh, performed randomized one-to-one. -one. Um, and um, we see here 
that um, though these curves do show some separation and improvement in the, the primary endpoint of median overall survival, 13.9 months for pembrolizumab versus 10.6 months for placebo, hazard ratio of 0.78. Um, the, the study did not meet the pre-specified uh, p-value required for significance under the statistical plan. So while there was an improvement in outcomes, it was not statistically significant under the study design, in part due to a dual primary endpoint and in part um, due to the sample size. Nonetheless, we again see that a, a subset of patients had durable responses, including uh, in this study about 18%. Um, and the, the median duration of response was 13.8 months. So returning back to the Checkmate 040 trial with the last few minutes of this study, of this uh, section, and I'll show you here the, the data we have so far on the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab in the second line setting, the first IO plus IO or immunooncology doublet in this context. Um, and so nivolumab plus IPI has been studied in second-line patients in, with, who've been uh, previously treated with serafinib or progression, intolerant or progression on serafinib. Um, again, looking at patients according to viral status, non-viral of HCV or, um, or HBV um, and child PUA patients. So this data was presented at ILCA, the ILCA meeting this year and looked at three different dose levels of nivolumab and ipilimumab, the two IO agents in combination. And we see uh, quite encouraging um, increase in objective response rate using a, a central uh, response um, review, 30%, about 30% in each arm. These responses were quite durable, lasting over 17, around 17 months or longer in each cohort. And we see here they are also coupled with uh, really encouraging survival signal, um, including an arm A with the, the highest dose of IPI, um, reaching 22.8 months in a second line population again. Um, when we look at the safety, however, that's again the most important, one of the important questions before we bring forward a new combination in HCC. Um, I think uh, it's important to highlight here that the arm A with the higher dose IPI did have an increased rate of hepatic adverse events in particular, and systemic corticosteroids were used to treat uh, treatment-related adverse immune events in 51% of patients in this cohort. So a very important signal of efficacy coupled by increased immune toxicity that requires careful patient selection. Um, this encouraging data has launched uh, the phase three Checkmate 90W trial of nivolumab plus ipilimumab in combination versus first-line serafinib or lenvatinib according to physician choice. Um, and lastly, before we conclude this section, I'll share some additional uh, uh, second-line data on the, com the other additional, the, another immuno-oncology combination, dervalimab plus tremolimumab. Dervalimab is an anti-PDL1 inhibitor. Tremolimumab is a CTLA4 inhibitor like IPI. Um, and we have uh, looked at this combination again in, in a variety of different viral contexts and in a phase 1B context with about 40 patients. Um, the uh, objective response rate um, was 17, uh, about 17% 17 for confirmed, 25% unconfirmed. Um, and this has prompted an ongoing randomized phase two, as well as the phase three Himalaya trial that Rich alluded to in the first line, um, with four different immuno-oncology, three different IO arms, dervalimab, dervalimab plus trimi with two different dose levels compared to the standard of care serafinib at that time. This was again in the first line context um, based on the second line data, and uh, the study is completed and cruel, and we expect results in the near future. Here are a selection of many ongoing trials of combination treatments with checkpoint inhibitors now in play. So lastly, to turn back to our case, um, following up with this patient who had rapid progression on serafinib, um, in him I chose to consider and treated with checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. Um, in particular, in patients who have not received immunotherapy in first line, we now look to immunotherapy in second line. I also consider in patients like this who have rapid progression or intolerance to TKI early in first line therapy. Um, in patients with increasing degrees of hepatic dysfunction, including, including child PUB, we have very little safety da data for patients to be treated with lenvatinib, um, and cabozantinib, ramucirumab, in fact. And there are, on the other hand, prospective cohort and retrospective case series showing acceptable safety and efficacy of NEVO, the PD-1 inhibitor NEVO, and child PUB HCC. 
And I also consider checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy as second or third line therapy in patients, of course, who have contraindications to antiangiogenic therapy. And my concluding points um, to take home, that a substantial proportion of patients receive at least second line therapy. At least 50% of patients who are eligible for first line trials are now getting to second line therapy. Um, and a subs a s another proportion of those, 50% perhaps, are also going to third line therapy. The choice of second line therapy depends on which agent they received in first line, and so it's a dramatically changing landscape, and we don't know yet how to position agents after a tezobev, which is a, a, the subject of future conferences to discuss. Um, and it also depends on the, how well they did on the first line therapy and their tolerability in the first line. Um, so my, my sense in the clinic is to consider a first line, uh, for patients who received a first line TKI, to consider a second line TKI um, depending on, in patients who had a prolonged benefit to their first line TKI and tolerated it well. Um, for patients who did not tolerate and had rapid progression, I'm more likely to choose a second line an IO agent. Um, in patients who received IO therapy in the first line, of course, we would uh, consider second line TKI. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Amit again, uh, who is a hepatologist, unlike Katie and I, who are oncologists. So, yeah, so hopefully I can, hopefully I can uh, fill the big shoes that preceded me. Tough, tough shoes to follow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, you know, from, uh, from the excellent presentations by both Rich and um, Katie, I think it's clear that there's been a lot of advances in the um, systemic space. Um, and I've been tasked with doing something a little bit different. We unfortunately haven't had those same advances in the early and um, intermediate space, but there are several trials that are ongoing. And um, you know, what I've been asked to do is really highlight some of these clinical trials that are ongoing that are promising and will hopefully yield similar um, improvements in survival for these patients who present at earlier stages. So to highlight um, this, I want to once again, similar to the prior presentation, start with a case. So this is a, a young patient who has chronic hepatitis B who's on treatment for his hepatitis B and has compensated cirrhosis. He's undergoing HCC surveillance and is found to have a liver mass. And fortunately, that was found early. So the liver mass is 3.5 centimeters, and it's a LIRADS-5. So on imaging is consistent with HCC, therefore doesn't need to undergo a biopsy. Um, his liver function is compensated, as we discussed. His, he's a child PUA patient, and his platelet count is preserved at 217, suggesting he does not have portal hypertension. He has good performance status. So I think when you take a look at the BCLC staging system, he clearly falls into this early stage category, which Rich alluded to earlier. So he would be somebody who would fall into this BCLC stage A with a unifocal lesion, and he would be an optimal, he would be an optimal surgical candidate and therefore would undergo resection. And I think um, one of the things that I'd like to highlight when I have this slide up is that really early detection is one of the best ways that we can optimize survival. So patients who are found early and can undergo these curative therapies have um, a survival that exceeds five years and often reaches 10 plus years. So this patient is, um, is uh, uh, he undergoes a robotic liver resection. He does quite well, goes home early. Um, and he comes to your clinic and he then discusses what does he need to do. He's now cured from his HCC, um, but wants to talk about the risk of recurrence and the need for continued surveillance. And so as I discussed, you know, when you undergo resection, this really is associated with long-term survival. The five-year survival rates with resection um, approach 70%. However, you leave behind that cirrhotic liver, and one of the downsides of resection is really the high recurrence rate, which mirror that of the survival. So the recurrence at five years approaches 70 to 80 percent. And here you can see in this table there are some factors that are associated um, either with survival or with recurrence. But you can see that patients who have uh, multifocal tumors, larger tumors, have a positive margin, or have um, greater blood loss are associated with either higher recurrence or poorer survival. And you can see from this figure, when you take a look at a large cohort of patients who underwent resection from a, um, from a uh, high volume center, you can see that the recurrence rate at one year, about one third of patients have recurrence. And when you, um, when you reach that two year mark, the recurrence rate is over 50%, with a median time to recurrence of 22 months. 
So this really highlights that the survival is good, but there is a need for adjuvant therapy that can help decrease HCC recurrence. So Rich talked about the SHARP trial and the excitement that came after the SHARP trial, and he talked about how I think anyone who was in the field at that time was thinking that this was the first of many trials that would lead to a multitude of first-line um, options. And I think in parallel with that, we also thought that this could be an adjuvant therapy to help reduce recurrence um, after resection or ablation. And this basically led to the phase three storm trial, which evaluated serafinib as an adjuvant therapy after resection or ablation. And so this randomized control trial um, uh, either placed people on serafinib or placebo, and you can see that there were over 1,000 patients with a primary outcome of recurrence-free survival. And unfortunately, there was no difference in recurrence-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.94 and um, a median recurrence-free survival of just over 33 months for both groups. As a secondary outpoint, they also looked at um, overall survival, and similarly, you see no difference in overall survival. So unfortunately, despite serafinib's um, effectiveness in the um, advanced space, this did not appear to be an effective intervention in the adjuvant setting. So, of course, like everything else, we're now reevaluating um, everything with the excitement that comes with the checkpoint inhibitors. And so, there are now a multitude of trials that are reevaluating whether we can identify an adjuvant therapy that can help reduce the risk of recurrence. And so, I'm, um, over the next four slides, you're going to see four ongoing trials that are evaluating different agents in this setting. So, first, starting with a Checkmate 9DX trial, this is taking patients who undergo resection or ablation, but are thought to be high risk for recurrence. And so high risk of recurrence can be defined by a multitude of different um, criteria. So this can be multifocal lesions, so three lesions, um, largest being less than five that undergo resection. You can have, um, it can be, um, you can have microvascular invasion or it can be poorly differentiated. Or if it's undergoing ablation, you can be between this three to five centimeter uh, size um, cutoff. So these patients are all regarded to be higher risk of recurrence, but have no evidence of residual disease after that treatment. And these patients otherwise have good liver function, good performance status, and those patients are being randomized to either nivolumab or placebo with a primary endpoint of recurrence-free survival. Similarly, there's the phase three keynote study, which has very similar inclusion exclusion criteria. So high risk of recurrence after undergoing um, surgical resection or ablation, um, 950 patients who are um, being randomized to, to Pembro or placebo. And this trial has co-primary outcomes of recurrence free survival and overall survival. Next trial is the phase three Emerald two trial. This is um, evaluating adjuvant DERVA plus minus BEV. So once again, high-risk um, candidates after surgical resection or ablation, uh, patients have to be disease-free 28 days prior to randomization, um, and they're being randomized to one of three arms, DERVA plus BEV, DERVA alone, or placebo, primary endpoint being recurrence-free survival. And finally, the I Am Brave 50 trial, which is evaluating adjuvant Atezo um, and BEV. Similar inclusion-exclusion criteria, 660 patients being randomized to Atezo plus BEV or um, placebo with a primary endpoint of recurrence-free survival. So the fact that we have four ongoing trials all actively enrolling does highlight that this is an area that has, that has been identified as an area of need, a lot of excitement, and I think that we're going to see um, hopefully um, positive data or at least exciting data come out of these trials soon. In addition to adjuvant trial, um, uh, therapy, there's also been excitement for the possibility of neoadjuvant therapy. And so this is a phase two study that's um, ongoing by uh, Kossip and colleagues. And so this is evaluating neoadjuvant NEVO plus minus IPI in, in patients who are deemed to be resectable. You have 26 patients who have been randomized to either NEVO or NEVO plus um, IPI um, at the doses you can see here. Um, both of those arms are given for six weeks, and then the surgical resection is done within four weeks of the last cycle. And then they continue adjuvant um, therapy for up to two years after the resection. Um, the data that was presented before was on the first five patients, um, or six patients, and there was a pathologic complete response in um, about one-third of patients. The updated data continues to show that you do see a pathologic response in a high proportion of patients, 25% uh, in the update, two in the first arm, and three in arm B. 
Um, and then you can see that um, overall the, the therapy does, ex does appear to be well tolerated, but I think the thing that does bear observation is how many patients could have disease progression during this time period that would otherwise prevent those patients from undergoing resection. And so um, in the update, it appears that surgery was aborted in five patients and three of them for disease progression. And so for those of you who may remember, this is, um, this is a potential concern. So when TACE was evaluated as a neoadjuvant therapy, this was observed in a, in a proportion of patients where then surgical resection was not deemed to be possible. And that was one of the things that really prevented TACE from being used as a neoadjuvant therapy. And so I think this will be one of the things that will need to be looked at um, as this continues to be evaluated. Um, this is only one of many studies that are also going on in the neoadjuvant setting, and you can see the others being listed here. There's Nevo plus Cabo, there's Pembro alone, and then there's um, Semipilumab. Um, but basically, there's multiple studies that are evaluating this in the neoadjuvant as well as the adjuvant setting. So moving beyond um, the patients who present with resectable disease, I think that uh, you know, there's clearly an area of need as well in the intermediate stage. And so to, to discuss the trials that are ongoing in the intermediate stage, um, I'd like to start with a case of a 64-year-old uh, male with NASH and compensated cirrhosis who was found to have an incidental liver mass. Um, this patient presents with a uh, larger tumor burden. He has a 6.5 centimeter lesion, two satellite nodules. Uh, fortunately, no vascular invasion, no metastatic disease. He has good liver function, CHALPUA, and good performance status. So going um, back to the, the BCLC, the Barcelona staging system, you can see that this patient presents beyond an early stage, but does present within BCLC stage B. And as many of you may recall, this is where chemoembolization and radioembolization have really been the main therapies um, that we've used to treat these patients. And already, as alluded um, to by Rich, these therapies have prolonged survival but have not been curative. And this is one of the areas um, of need in terms of improving both survival as well as the responses we can observe in these patients. So just to briefly review, this was a nice systematic review that was published um, a couple of years ago that um, outlines the, the outcomes that we see with chemoembolization. The, the systematic review largely focused on lipidol, um, traditional chemoembolization. Um, I think there's a couple things that are worth pointing out. The first, that chemoembolization has been evaluated in a large number of patients. And I think going back to Rich's point, this is largely because of the limitations of systemic therapy in, in the early days and chemoembolization being the therapy that was used for many, many HCC patients. But the good thing is that over time, we've realized that chemoembolization is relatively a safe therapy in most patients. You can see that complications in skilled hands are relatively low, um, and the mortality also being low at 0.6%. But I think that I did say in the setting of skilled hands, and I think that's important because there's a lot of operator dependency with chemoembolization in how this is delivered and the outcomes you will see. Overall, when you take a look over the entire time period, you can see that um, chemoembolization is able to provide very high um, short-term survival. So you see an 81% six-month survival and a 70% one-year survival. But as you start going out, you see only a 40% three-year survival and a 32% five-year survival. And that's really where we need to see improvements. The fortunate thing is as we've learned um, more about chemoembolization, there has been um, some improvements. So you can see when you, sub, when you stratify by the year of publication, um, the three-year survival used to be um, in the 20, 28-30% range, and the more recent publications, we have seen the three-year survival climb closer to 43%. So we have seen some improvements over time. One of those improvements has been um, the, the transition from conventional tastes to deb tastes. Um, so this was evaluated in the Precision uh, 5 study, and I think overall, when you take a look at these randomized data, there was no difference in actual outcomes. There was no difference in survival or response rates, but we do see that overall, um, deb taste appears to be better tolerated. So the AE profile with deb taste is better than that of conventional taste, and I think many centers have largely transitioned to using deb taste as the conventional way to deliver this therapy. 
The other um, advance that we've seen is that many centers have, um, at least in the United States, have also started to increasingly adopt radioembolization. Um, radioembolization has been primarily evaluated in single arm studies, and so there's a large number um, of single arm studies that show reasonable outcomes with radioembolization, showing good responses, showing good tolerability. Unfortunately, there's been very little randomized data with radioembolization, and this is one of the things that's precluded it um, uh, um, um, be having a center place in many guidelines um, for treatment of patients with uh, local regional disease. Here you can see data from a small randomized control trial that was conducted in a single center conducted by Riyadh uh, Salem and colleagues. This, uh, this trial included, um, unfortunately, a grand total of 45 patients that were randomized between chemoembolization and radio radioembolization. And I think the, the key things to take away here is that there was a significant difference, even though this was a small trial, in progression-free survival. And you can see that radioembolization had significantly longer progression-free survival than chemoembolization. However, the overall survival curves nearly overlapped. And using the data that have come out of this center, it's actually it predicted that you would need a trial with over 1,000 patients to actually start to see a survival difference between these two therapies. Um, despite that, I will say that um, even in our center, we've largely shifted to radioembolization for many of these patients, given the tolerability and given the progression-free survival data. However, although these data are nice and we're starting to see improvements, I think that overall, I think we can agree we're not where we want to be. And there, there, um, there has been a desire to try combination therapies to see if we can also improve outcomes for patients with intermediate stage disease. And there is some scientific rationale for trying to move the TKIs into this space. And so um, without spending too much time on this slide given time, I will say that um, I think all of us are aware that after you do a chemoembolization, you do see surges in um, some factors like VEGF, um, HIF1-alpha, that can cause um, angiogenesis, which may uh, um, uh, explain some of the continued escape after chemoembolization. And there's an immunomodulatory change that also can cause continued tumor growth and the presence of metastases. And there's some rationale for both TKIs as well as IOs being used in combination with many of these local regional therapies, which may improve outcomes for these patients. So unfortunately, despite the scientific rationale, when you take a look at the data um, evaluating this, unfortunately, those the data have not borne out any beneficial effect for combining TKIs with chemoembolization. So there have been multiple trials that have evaluated this um, with, a, with a grand total of over 2,000 patients. Those trials have included endpoints of time to progression, overall survival, as well as progression-free survival. And I think overall, the one thing you can take away here is that all five studies fail to show a benefit of combining TKI therapy with chemoembolization. Um, these trials include um, trials that were done in the United States, trials that were done in Europe, as well as trials that were done in Asia. And unfortunately, despite differences in patient populations, small differences in terms of trial design, all of them failed to show a benefit. Interestingly enough, there was a, um, a study that was presented um, here uh, last, uh, now two years ago, um, that did show um, a potential benefit um, of combining TKI therapy with, with local regional therapy. And I think that some people think that this opens up that box again uh, for us to maybe evaluate this. So this was the tactics trial, it was a phase two study. Um, that included uh, just around 160 patients uh, that were randomized to TACE alone or TACE plus serafinib. Um, and I think one of the unique things about this trial is that it did not evaluate um, typical progression, but used um, the unique endpoint of untasteable disease. So meaning progression to the point where you can no longer taste patients, whether that's uh, progression outside of the liver or significant liver dysfunction. Um, and this resulted in patients staying on the serafinib significantly longer than the prior studies that evaluated um, the combination therapy. And what the, what the authors of this study found was that um, when you take a look at this, progression-free survival, which was the primary endpoint, was significantly longer um, with the combination compared to taste alone, 25.2 months versus 13.5 months with a 41% reduction in progression-free survival. 
Unfortunately, um, they weren't uh, uh, um, able uh, to evaluate overall survival, both at the time of this presentation as well as the final publication, which is now um, available. Um, but I think that overall you can say that there may be some lessons that you can learn from the difference in terms of the, the results from this trial versus the prior trials, um, including, once again, the difference in terms of this outcome, the, maybe the importance of the duration of the serafinib, um, and then the other thing that was different in terms of this trial is that they started the serafinib before the um, chemoembolization. Patients were on the serafinib for at least three weeks going into the chemoembolization, which may have allowed a greater effect um, and a greater benefit compared to some of the other studies. Overall, in terms of my opinion, I think that this is an interesting study. I don't necessarily think that um, it should open back this, it should open up the box again. I still think that the preponderance of data, in my opinion, still shows that there's um, no proven benefit of combining the two therapies versus, t versus taste alone. Of course, like everything else, um, the, um, the IO agents have created new excitement, and um, there's a lot of trials that are now evaluating the combination of IO agents in combination with local regional therapy. Um, here you can see um, a brief, uh, I think this is a copy from some of the figures from a presentation uh, in J-Hepatology, where they took patients with um, intermediate and advanced stage disease, the majority having advanced stage disease. These patients were treated with uh, TREMI, and then the patients underwent an ablation. And what the, the authors of this study saw was that you can see that um, compared to before, you see an increase in CD3, CD8 cells. Um, you can see that... Um, that these patients had a nice decrease in terms of tumor burden and a decrease in terms of AFP. And so this was a relatively small study, but I think that the authors of the study um, basically uh, um, concluded that uh, local regional therapy can help promote an, uh, a change in the, uh, the, immuno, uh, the immune environment that can uh, potentially augment the effect of immunotherapy. Um, and so because of the excitement in this area, you can see that there are several trials. I am not going to go through each of these um, uh, one by one, but you can see that there are trials not only for the intermediate stage patients, but also the locally advanced patients. Uh, once again, with the idea that, um, that these two can be synergistic in terms of the IO agents potentiating the effect of the local regional therapy, as well as the local regional therapy may be potentiating the effect of the systemic therapy for patients with more advanced disease. And I think that these two groups of trials are separate, but I think both are promising and could uh, further advance how we treat these patients in the future. Just briefly, I'm going to just highlight a couple to just um, uh, highlight the, um, the potential that we do see in these trials. So this is the phase 1B PETL trial. So this is Pembro following TACE. Uh, treatment duration here you can see 2.8. We only have four radiologically evaluable patients. Three had stable disease on Pembro. One had progressive disease. Very small numbers, um, very early. Um, this is mainly just looking at safety, and I think that what you can say is that all of the AEs were expected, um, and I think this really, this really requires further uh, evaluation as we move forward. Um, phase three emerald one study, so this is TACE plus immunotherapy. These patients are um, unsuitable for curative therapy, either resection, ablation, or transplantation, amenable to chemoembolization, um, good liver function, and these patients are being randomized to one of three arms, DERVA plus TACE, DERVA plus TACE plus BEV versus TACE um, alone, and the primary outcome is really comparing arm A, which is the DERVA TACE arm to the TACE alone, looking at progression-free survival, and then a secondary outcome is looking at um, arm B, progression-free survival versus TACE alone. I think the one thing that um, I would remark is that, you know, these BCLC staging um, uh, categories, whether this is A, B, or C, um, are nice because they're relatively simple. I think mo many of us in the room, if you asked us, can draw the BCLC staging system because it is simple. And it gives us a nice tool that we can easily apply to our patients at the bedside. But I think that it's clear that these are heterogeneous categories. And so within a B, there are quote unquote good Bs and there are bad Bs. And there are Bs that are more like Cs and there are Bs that are more like As. And so I think that it's, this is a heterogeneous group and I think there's more and more recognition that I think we shouldn't be treating all Bs the same. And so this was a, 
um, at least in my opinion, a nice prognostic score that broke out um, bees and their response to chemoembolization. And it used essentially the sum of the number of lesions plus the size. So relatively, once again, simple to do. And when you get this, you have nice cutoffs of six and 12. And so if you have um, uh, the sum of the lesions uh, plus the size and you're less than six, the median survival is 49 months after chemoembolization. The intermediate category is 32 months. And then if your sum of the size plus lesions is greater than 12, you can see the median survival is dramatically lower at 16 months, actually much closer to what you see with systemic disease rather than local regional disease. And I bring this up because maybe it shouldn't be one size fits all. And maybe there are some patients with local regional disease um, that should be instead treated with systemic disease. And I think if there's any interventional radiologist, I expect you to come up here and beat me after. But I do think that, um, that there are some patients with, systemic, with, with advanced local regional disease that may be better treated with systemic therapy. Of course, we need further trials to evaluate this. So this was an interesting presentation um, by Kudo and colleagues taking a look at LEN versus TACE in patients with, once again, larger B uh, tumors. So this is beyond up to seven. Once again, same kind of idea, but using a threshold of seven. Propensity score matched analysis. And you can see these patients did better on LEN than they did with TACE. Small numbers interesting data. I don't think it answers it, and I don't think that this says that we should be doing this routinely in our patients, but I think hypothesis generating uh, for how we may move forward in the, in the future. Um, as a hepatologist, I want to leave with one last thing. I do think that it's important for us to remember that transplant is the cure for both the HEC as well as um, the, uh, the, the cirrhosis as well as the HEC, and I think that we have to recognize that there are some patients with larger tumors who can respond to local regional therapies and be downstaged into transplant criteria and be transplanted. And the reason why I bring this up is as um, IO therapies come into this space, I think, at least in my opinion, one of the things that we have to do as we start to think about who should receive IO therapy versus not is to first consider is this patient potentially transplantable. And if this patient is potentially transplantable, then I think that it's important for us to know that and then to discuss that with the transplant team if they should be or can be, can be treated with a checkpoint inhibitor. And the reason why this is important is because checkpoint inhibitors clearly change your immune environment and we don't know how long that lasts. And there have been studies that suggest that you significantly increase the risk of graft rejection. And so you may be withholding a curative treatment from this patient if you put this patient on a checkpoint inhibitor prior to consideration of transplant. So um, in summary, curative therapies in, such as ablation resection offer long-term cure, but they, they unfortunately have a high risk of recurrence. There's a clear need for either adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy. Several trials ongoing. If you have one of these high-risk patients in your practice, highly encourage you to find a clinical trial nearby to enroll those high-risk patients. Local regional therapies likewise have yielded improved survival and tolerability over time. They're great therapies. Um, unfortunately, they're just not the perfect answer. And I think that those patients who have larger tumor burden offer a perfect opportunity for combinations or maybe even systemic therapy alone for select patients. Thank you. Thanks, Mami, for our ABCs. So I, I think we've covered a lot of material tonight, and, and hopefully you found it useful. But there have been very, several questions from the audience. Some of them are the same theme, so for the sake of time, I'll try to summarize. But given the possibility and likelihood that IO comes to front line, Right? Uh, the I Am Brave study, I think, gave us now high level phase three evidence. What will be coming next? Roles for TKIs? Uh, can you use IO after IO? Can you use RAM after BEV? Uh, I, I, I think, in general, we do not have high level evidence to guide us, right? This is progress. Uh, similarly, in the second line, as Katie mentioned, many of the drugs we've looked at were done only after prior serafinib. But we have other drugs now in front line, LEN, so does that mean we cannot use our clinical judgment? So personally, I'll answer this first. If a patient gets for perhaps Bevitezo front line, I think I would then start to sequence TKIs. First line, TKI, serafinib, or LEN. Then second line, uh, another TKI, REG, REGO, or CABO. Uh, if they're high AFP, then certainly ramucirumab might be an option 
Uh, Katie, your thoughts? Or, and, and they also, someone asked about CTLA-4 after Frontline. Yeah. I think that, I currently think that the best we can do is to follow, after Atezobev, is to probably revert to our current TKI sequencing paradigm. However, I think this really shows how incumbent it is upon us as, as clinical researchers and as a field to start parsing out through clinical sub-analyses of the data that we're gathering at such a rapid rate, as well as all the biospecimens we're getting to really look for clinical and biological biomarkers to identify that subset of patients who tend to be the IO responders. Um, you know, whether it's right now we're thinking about 15% of patients will respond to monotherapy with other, based on the Pembro and the Nevo, and with combinations now with the Tezabev, we're seeing almost 30%. That's also what we saw with the ipi nevo combo. Don't know yet if that's a sort of a ceiling and based on sort of the immune profile of the, uh, the immune-enriched um, subset of HCC or whether we can do better with different types of combinations. Those are the questions for, you know, the next decade of HCC research. Yeah, and, and this, the idea that we have these questions reflects the progress, right? Absolutely. Uh, and I don't think we should, in practice, we need to, you know, I think still give patients the best chance of getting as much active agents as possible, which goes to Amit's talk, right? No longer, I think, do you continue to do taste beyond taste progression. Mm -hmm. Patients cannot get taste until their bilirubin becomes three or four because we'll miss the opportunity for the benefit from systemic treatment. And also you raised the question of about, you know, systemic treatment versus taste. And before when we did not have so many active drugs, I don't think anyone would question that, but now that we have drugs with very high response rates, uh, that might be a possibility. So there were several questions about choosing a drug in the first line setting, and, and given that Bev and Atezo are not yet approved, we have Len and Serafnib. Amit, how do you determine between the two of them? Is there one best option or optimal option? Yeah, no, I think um, right now, um, I largely choose on the AE profile, so I think, you know, um, I think, uh, well, Rich, you did this. You highlighted very nicely the differences between the AE profile of these two agents in the frontline setting. Um, we see more hand, foot, skin with uh, serafinib, and I think that you see a little bit more, um, you know, fatigue, anorexia, and then hypertension um, with uh, Len. And so I think really what I do is I talk about both options um, and really choose on AE profile primarily. Um, I think overall, I don't think there's a one answer. I think that you know the reflect trial showed that the overall survival between the two um, is similar. Yeah, and uh, I guess I would add to that because I still use a fair amount of serafinib because I think OS is the most important endpoint. Uh, there's been data that shows that if you do respond to serafinib or lenvantinib in the frontline setting, uh, perhaps you live longer, and that was from Dr. Kudo's analysis at uh, last year's ASCO GI meeting. Uh, you know, and I think tolerability is important, but also response. You know, some patients have low burden disease, but they're advanced, and I think serafinib is very acceptable. Uh, but then there's patients who you want a response, right? They have a large tumor burden. If they don't respond, they will probably go into liver failure quicker, and therefore maybe lenvantamine might be appropriate there. The one thing that I want to add is that, you know, you point out the Gideon data. So we do have a lot of real-world experience with serafinib, and so for those patients that are extended outside of those trial criteria, particularly those patients with child B disease, which are often excluded from clinical trials, but unfortunately are often the patients that come into like our clinical practice, um, I think that's a patient where I feel more comfortable using serafinib while we're waiting for real-world data in terms of lenvatinib in these extended populations. I agree. So, so Katie, uh, well, you alluded to this HBV CABO correlation. Is there uh, some hypotheses behind that? Well, I think um, if we look at the forest plots for the celestial trial, we do see that the, the Hep B cohort intriguingly had a trend towards improved PFS and OS. Whether that's an artifact or a, a, just a function of the population and the, the prior treatments and um, other variables, it's really hard to discern from that level of data. Um, but um, MET signaling as a resistance mechanism is, is one of the hypotheses. And I think beyond that, we can't, we can't explain it, but um, it's, it's a, a reasonable hypothesis. So along those lines, someone gets lenvantinib frontline. Is there an optimal second-line option? 
Um, I think right now we don't really know what the best choice is. And as I, I mentioned, I think in patients who have had a long benefit from their first-line TKI, I tend to use a second-line TKI. And if they receive lumvatinib first-line, I tend to use CAVO second-line, simply because it was more permissive in its eligibility, allowing one or two prior lines of therapy, and it didn't have to be simply serapim immediately mm -hmm. beforehand. So that is the closest proxy to real world in this context of Lenva first. Um, in patients who did very poorly on their first line TKI with poor tolerability and rapid progression, now that we have IO therapies, and because I want patients to have a chance to have an IO response um, before discontinuing all anti cancer treatment, I tend to use IO therapies if they're eligible in patients who did really poorly on a first line I, I, TKI. That's why I'm curious to hear your, your practices as well, because there is no right answer yet. Yeah, there is. Uh, and, and for the sake of time, we'll go with yeah. your answer. But I will add <laughs> so the negative phase three. Nevo, frontline, uh, I'm biased, but relatively negative or positive, half <laughs> full, half empty, 240 study with Pembro. Does that change your use of these agents in second line or third line? For me, no, because I think that we have a preponderance of data re re reassuring us that we have a subset of patients with a durable, meaningful, deep response endpoint that has been proven across drugs, across populations, and is reproducible. Um, that said, where these where monotherapy fits as a as first, second, or later line um, agent will really requires more mature data, whether it's from 459 or, or for, from uh, further data sets with Pembro. I think but, particularly given the fact that the like, keynote is more of a statistical anomaly rather than a lack of effect. I mean, right. so I think that like, if anything, I think that reinforced the fact that you can continue to use this in the second line setting, in my opinion. So for the sake of time, I'll try to wrap up. Uh, so Len single agent, ORR 40%, using the two agents, someone wrote Len Bev, but I think they mean Len Pembro was 36%. I think it's com comparing M resist and resist. So. Uh, the 40% from REFLECT was modified RESIST by independent review. If we look at RESIST in REFLECT, it was uh, about 18%. If we look at RESIST with the combination of LEN-PEMBRO, that's where we get 36%. So it's, it is almost doubled. Uh, did I and BRAVE include patients with macrovascular invasion? Yes. In fact, they had a very high risk population of patients who, compared to other studies, had a higher incidence of main portal vein invasion or vascular invasion. And I thank you all for your attendance, uh, and I hope you found it useful. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash BXY860. This educational activity is supported by medical education grants from Exelixis Incorporated, Genentech, and Merck and Company Incorporated.